world with more than 200 chemicals in their bodies. They are born pre-polluted. What impact is this toxic mix having on the health of our kids? Dr. Sanjay Gupta investigates. CNN's Toxic Childhood starts right now. For life today is so much more pleasant. Yes, it's good to be alive today. It's 1947, Anytown, USA. No doubt you've heard of DDT, jet propulsion, the atom bomb, in short, the better known wonders of the modern world. I'm here to take a look at the latest wonder product, the pesticide DDT. It's a handful of concentrated death. Hmm, that sounds dangerous. Well, this new insect destroyer contains a lot of DDT, not just a little. Its DDT content is even higher than government specifications. But it's nothing to worry about, right? After all, they said it was safe. Used right, it is absolutely harmless to humans and animals. You could use it anywhere in the home. It's perfect for ridding Fido of those unwelcome house guests. It's even safe around children. A generation of new pesticides, liquids, powders, sprays, everywhere. Look, we all know how this turned out. The promise of safety was completely untrue. And good evening, I'm Dr. Sanjay Gupta. That film clip was a 1947 version of an infomercial, and it was actually shown in department stores to try and sell the new pest killer, DDT. They did seem so naive back then about the dangers. But you know what? There is evidence that we're starting to repeat the same pattern, using chemicals that we're told are safe today, only to find out that they're not. So tonight in Toxic Childhood, we ask questions. How are common chemicals impacting the health of our children, and what can we do to minimize the risks for our kids? As a reporter, a doctor, and most importantly, as a father of three, I believe it's time for some real answers. So we begin tonight with the very latest science that reveals a broad mix of chemicals now entering our children's bodies before they're even born. Here in the womb, enveloped in darkness and warmth, a baby's life begins in earnest. It is a sacred space, pristine, insulated, more than nine months of safe refuge from the world outside. Can you imagine a baby sort of nice and safe and tucked away in the womb, uh, impervious mm. to all the assaults that occur on the body. You say not so fast? Not so fast. The placenta is doing its, its work as, as well as it can, but it is not a perfect barrier. And many chemicals do pass relatively easily across the placenta. Chemicals? In here? <coughs> Babies are born every day with not one, not two, but hundreds of toxic substances. <coughs> In a study by the Environmental Working Group, a nonprofit environmental advocacy organization, an average of 232 chemicals were measured in the cord blood of 10 babies born late last year. Now there's no science yet that demonstrates conclusive cause and effect between this mix of toxins our children are born with and particular health problems. But many leading pediatricians believe it's precisely what we do not know that makes this so troubling. For 80% of the common chemicals in everyday use in this country, we know almost nothing about whether or not they can damage the brains of children, the immune system, the reproductive system, the other developing organs. It's, it's, a, it's really a terrible mess we've gotten ourselves into. The list of chemicals measured in cord blood is, well, long. PBDEs, flame retardants in computers, televisions, mattresses, furniture, BPA in food cans, bottle tops, hard plastics, PFCs, water repellents, used to make non-stick products, food packaging, carpeting, furniture. Phthalates, found in a wide array of products from children's toys to cosmetics. But how do they make their way from out here to in here? The answer may be inside this backpack. I began investigating two years ago. All the air that you're breathing in will be filtered in through this device. 
these are adjustable straps. All right, let's adjust them. Yeah. It's not a perfect model for the lung, but it is a good indication of what's in the air that the women are breathing and what could potentially be transferred to the fetus. Dr. Frederica Pereira is 12 years into a landmark study at Columbia University Center for Children's Environmental Health, following hundreds of pregnant women as they navigate these city streets, measuring their exposure to toxic substances, vehicle emissions, pesticides, secondhand smoke. Each one wears a backpack with a tube that acts like a lung sucking in the same air that they're breathing. What researchers found was stunning. It surprised me when we analyzed the air samples and found that 100% of them had detectable levels of at least one pesticide and the air pollutants that we were interested in, every single one. 100% had pesticides, pollutants that scientists were testing for, eventually making their way from mom into the womb. Now, it would be one thing if these chemicals were innocuous, but studies in both animals and humans suggest they may not be. These chemicals can have effects on brain development. All of that forces us to examine the safety of the safe haven. I hope this goes well, getting the message out. You know, for a year now, as CNN investigated toxic chemicals, just about everyone we talked to said, look, they're probably safe. A little bit's not going to hurt you or we just don't know. But that isn't good enough. I mean, after all, they used to say the same thing about lead while it was silently poisoning children. And the man who finally changed that flawed thinking, Phil Landrigan. As a young researcher with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in 1970, Dr. Philip Landrigan went to El Paso to investigate possible lead poisoning in children as a result of this smelter, extracting lead from ore and sending tons of lead dust into the air. I was the leader of a two-man CDC team that went to El Paso to look into the situation. We found an epidemic of lead poisoning. When they drew the results on a map, bullseye. The main finding was that in the closest circle, 60% of kids had elevated blood lead levels. In the next circle, 25%. In the third circle, 10%. So there was really a bullseye distribution of lead poisoning in El Paso with the epicenter right at the smelter. The surprise wasn't that kids closest to the smelter got sick. It was what happened to the children farther away. At lower levels of exposure, it still caused loss of intelligence, disruption of behavior, a whole spectrum of damage to the brain and the nervous system. Landrigan's research helped bring about a ban on lead paint and leaded gasoline. The federal government now says there is no safe level of lead. Any exposure could cause some brain or central nervous system damage. And there went the notion that just a little bit of lead was OK. Well, nowadays, everyone knows lead is dangerous. But here's a question. What is the next lead? And Jimmy and Nancy Chuda have been making it their life's mission really to answer that question. For them, it all began after a devastating tragedy. Their four-year-old daughter, Colette, was diagnosed with a rare form of kidney cancer. Nine months of aggressive treatment couldn't save their only child. She died before her fifth birthday. Um, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Sergeant. Thanks for sharing your story. I have three daughters of my own, and when I, when I heard about your story, I, you can't help but think about your own kids in a situation like this. And everybody wants to do best by their kids, make sure they're taking care of them. Um, and I know, obviously, so many years later, uh, Mr. Chita still obviously affects you, uh, I'm sure, emotionally. It, have, you, have you reached any closure? I mean, do you know what happened with Colette? Well, I think that uh, it's, um, we, we have suspicions, and the, there has been a test that came out uh, after we started our organization. Uh, in the beginning, we knew that it wasn't genetically. Uh, we had tests and everything, so we knew it had to be something else that caused it. And, uh, you know, because it wasn't in any of our family or background or history or anything. So. It wasn't hereditary. You, you did right. all the testing, uh, Nancy. I, w w the environment was something you, you really thought about. Well, the environment really was the trigger. Um, after Colette passed, we had these genetic tests, and it seemed obvious to us if it isn't something that's genetic, then what could it have been in the environment? And a year later, in 1995, a study came out in, in the uh, American Journal of Epidemiology, a Brazilian study that linked Wilms tumor 
to pesticide exposure. That's the type of cancer she exactly. had. Exactly. The non-hereditary 